This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. All of our podcasts are available from our website, www.sas.ac.uk. Hi, I'm really happy to be here, and uh, um, I'm also really happy that Herman wrote this book I'm here to talk about. Um, it's a very frustrating book, and it's very important. <laughs> and I'm going to get shortly to why I think it's frustrating, and why I think it's important is that it raises some really deep and challenging questions um, that it would be very, very good for meta philosophy to get clearer about. Um, questions that concern the well, fundamentally concern the characterization of their subject matter. Um, it's curiously hard to pin down uh, in an informative and general non-question begging way um, ahead of time, right? Uh, but um, I also think. This is not an uncommon predicament. Um, well, Brian was just talking about a similar phenomenon. Um, I uh, am not going to uh, argue that we have intuitions, like we, we have intuitions about intuitions and not that we identify what they are. Uh, but because I, I mean, I don't think of this larger uh, recognition of capacity as the kind of thing that meta philosophers are after when they uh, talk about intuitions. But I do think that we have this. Uh, uh, Common, we're often in a situation where um, we are at lots of sort of giving a general characterization of the subject matter before we get started. So I think that's kind of fine. If, if we don't think it's kind of fine, if we take Herman's conclusions um, to heart, um, conclusions he draws by intuitions, I think we should all shudder at the implications for our um, research projects. Uh, okay, so why, why do you think it's frustrating? Well, I think it's frustrating because um, Herman, um, although he's very systematic and in a certain sense very thorough, and I agree with him about most of the substantial points, I don't think he gives the main thesis he's up against a fair run for money. Uh, and I think that it gives various controversial interpretations of that thesis way too much of a run, more of a run than they deserve. Not controversial as in inter interpretations, quay interpretations, because people hold these views, but in, like controversial as in um, the thesis that uh, they are, are, you know, they, they're very controversial. So, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll get that. That's the conclusion, and now I'll give you the arguments. But I'll start with, um, by, I'll start with something else. I'll start with telling you something, okay? Uh, let me tell you this. I inherited this necklace from my grandmother, and she was born in Cairo. Do you believe me? Some of you? Okay, good. I take it you're justified. I take it some of you know that now. Maybe all of you know that now, and you know it because I told you. Take my belief that she was born in Cairo. Take her belief that she was born in Cairo. Take our joint belief or our beliefs that there was once a bird that was called a dodo and they couldn't fly and that was hunted to extinction. Um, there might be something, maybe perhaps, that these beliefs, the way we come to have them, the way they justify, the way they constitute knowledge, maybe there's something we have in common. Maybe just, just sort of a, not a crazy working assumption. Um, we can give a few more examples. But um, let's, let's, let's use a name. Let's call them. Testimonial, testimonial beliefs, testimonial justification, and then we go and investigate if, in fact, they have something interesting in common. Can we say a lot more about the class ahead of time? In fact, I don't think we can. We can say a bit more, but uh, we can't, um, well, I don't think we should. We shouldn't try uh, too hard to say too much about the etiology, uh, about what this, the, what unifies these uh, communicative acts that, you know, are involved or presumed to be involved in the generation of beliefs, what kinds of, what kind of inferential structure, if the inferential structure the justification has, and so on. Rather, we let, we should um, uh, try to just either, either give a very minimal characterization that's general, uh, or just work with the examples. Okay, so that's one example. Here's another one. Um, suppose um, um, yeah, we'll take something. I don't know which one I put in the handout. I put a bunch of different things, but let me just take it out. So. Um, Take the sentence, this is me. Take the assertion that this is me, and take random Bob's belief that he's making a mess or that that's a fire truck. Contrast his belief that the car or a car with such and such design and function, etc., is a fire truck. Is there something interesting, perhaps, about the first set of examples? Something about the context sensitivity? Perhaps we can draw a few more distinctions there, time, like between the context sensitivity of the linguistic expressions and that of the thoughts or context. But it seems like there's something, there's something I have to investigate, right? Let's call them. <laughs> and we'll go on and investigate. Right. So what's the point of doing on this? Well, later I'm going to give some, well, shortly I'm going to give some paradigms of intuitions, intuitive judgments, call them whatever you like. And um, 
uh, I think that the situation when it comes to them is exactly like it is here and like it is with so many other things that we set out to investigate. Like we don't really have a good general substantial characterization. We shouldn't aim for it because we're going to just close up question, close off questions in advance. At least we're going to risk closing off a lot of questions in advance. Um, so I also think that what what questions one should try not to close off in advance depends on the inquiry we're engaged in, right? So if we are um, it depends on the inquiry, and, and it depends on what um, is and isn't absolutely obvious, you know, or like, uh, I mean, that may also be relative, but, but the, so if we're interested in, in something like some prima facie unified class of beliefs and their epistemology, then um, trying to be, um, uh, what we should be wary of is, like closing off questions about that epistemology, like the justificatory structure, um, the uh, reliability profile. You know, if there, perhaps there are also other things um, about the class, like how should we interpret uh, the beliefs? Perhaps their surface content isn't really what it seems to be. So let's not like stipulate or, or like lay down too strong a claim about that either to start with, right? Like, because that's like it maybe may or may not bear on the epistemology, but it's like not obvious. Then we shouldn't do it. So uh, I um, think this goes for intuitions, intuitive judgment, whatever you call them. The thing, or one of the things that meta philosophy has been trying to talk about for a long time, or talk about. Um, I think it's crucial that we don't describe them or the category we take them to simplify in terms of non-obvious epistemological features, and there are very few obvious epistemological or psychological features about them, that's at least, for me, that's probably why they're interesting. So um, going with this is that the criteria that Herman is using throughout the book um, on his otherwise quite thorough journey through recent philosophy and media philosophy, um, on its earnest look at for, for intuitions, what could they be, what are they? Those criteria are terrible. <laughs> so of course Herman doesn't endorse them, um, but his opponents does, or his construed as doing so. And, and so a lot of the search looks to me not quite a fight against a straw man, but a fight against total non-starters. Okay. So that's, uh, so it should be obvious. I mean, it's not like I agree with the substance of what he's saying against those non-starters, but I'm just wondering why, like, why did he get so much attention? Um, okay. So Herman's main thesis um, is that contrary to what contemporary analytic philosophers tend to assume, and contemporary analytic metaphilosophers tend to explicitly assert, but state, um, they, we, do not rely on intuitions as evidence when we practice philosophy. Indeed, he sets himself the ambitious, exciting aim of showing that this is false, that any sensible construal of intuitions rely on philosophy, evidence, and philosopher. Right? Great. Um, this gets a little bit criticized, the, this, the, the, um, the claim that he claims is false, in, in, as centrality. So I put that on the handout. I think I had a direct quote. Um, so the, this is the first uh, um, characterization. Uh, this is the claim that contemporary analytic philosophers rely on intuitions as evidence or as a sort of evidence for philosophical theories. I don't think it matters because they're for or against, right? It's not, yeah. Um, and then there is a, I think it's just a specification of it, um, Centrality M for method. Philosophers rely in some epistemically significant way on intuitions when they make judgments about cases. Okay, uh, I don't. Uh, uh, I don't think that the fact that evidence, the term evidence, is dropped, makes a difference, right? It's not. Yeah. Um, so, what's Simon's strategy? Well, it's to he articulates and examines two broad kinds of argument for centrality. So, the argument from intuition talk. AIT, and the argument from philosophical practice, ATP. And, and he argues that neither one supports a feasible version of centrality. And so along the way, various versions of centrality are considered and rejected, versions that correspond to these two types of communication or arguments. So versions that exploit intuition talk and versions that exploit various aspects of the practice. Um, and what are these two arguments? Well, so the argument from intuition talk, and this is my restatement, um, uh, something like this. Philosophers frequently use intuition terminology uh, to characterize 
key premises in the arguments to describe evidence for the theories and so on. Um, so that's supposed to be evidence for centrality. So I guess there's something like a charity principle at play, but you know, charitable interpretation would be that they're right. <laughs> something like that. That there's and then the um, the other um, argument, the argument from philosophical practice, uh, again my statement, it's it's um, that philosophers something like this, if philosophers implicitly implicitly rely on intuitions in their practice. Maybe like so. Right? Then we get a description of the way they do it. Unless you have the like so, it's just a restatement of the previous centrality. So it has to be like, you have to get, then get a story about what that way is. What is that implicit reliance? What is that role? Or that uh, particular part they play in the practice. So here is what, so her strategy is to um, very thoroughly go through um, various interpretations of centrality and, and various readings of these arguments and corresponding interpretations of centrality. What he doesn't do uh, is to articulate, I, I think, is to articulate and target what he says is the most promising version um, or argument and argument for centrality uh, and then sort of most promising explication and then try to refine it and go on. Uh, maybe maybe it's one of those, but I was just uh, curious as to why. Um, so, so, um, and my main, my main worry is just kind of, or well, complaint, it's not, it's not really philosophical, it's just why not, you know, why, don't you, why isn't that the strategy of that, like, <laughs> um, why so much ink on, on the non-flutter? So for example, um, the, um, I'm going to uh, get to the, the more details soon, but like the, the argument from intuition talked, in particular there's a version of that that um, appeals to, or exploits the um, use or uses of intuition in ordinary English, so inside and outside philosophy, presumably, like the, the use. Um, and what's that like? Well, it's really messy. <laughs> but there's no one unified use. That seems pretty clear. Um, and uh, and then he goes through in, in, in nice detail of what these uses are and shows that none of them make for a feasible, uh, uh, feasible version of it. Is, none of them sort of can be used to support a feasible version for, of centrality. Uh, and yeah, that's, that seems absolutely right, but it's just, uh, I'm just not sure why anyone would have thought otherwise. Um, so the views that I do think, so, so that said though, the, the, so of course the challenge is then to say what the version of centrality is that he doesn't show is false, and I'm going to try to do that, but the, um, the version of versions that I think these two very successfully refutes can be captured by something like centrality non starter I put there and this there. And again, like this is non starter occurrence as if offered as a characterization of the subject matter, which I take this to be. Okay, we take it to attempt to be <laughs> an attempt to be. So it's kind of cumbersome, but but that would be something like this. Contemporary philosophers rely on intuitions as evidence or as a source of evidence for or against their philosophical theories, where intuitions are a the referent, perhaps the unique referent of the word intuition is used either in ordinary English or philosophers English, the semi-technical use. And or uh, intuitions are the quasi-perceptual mental states with the same true phenomenology and or are externally analytic, so based on contemporary times, maybe even a priori, and or are default justified. Where, um, and so that's, uh, those are different options. He doesn't assume that, um, his opponent doesn't hold or have to hold all of these views, but one of them at least, otherwise we don't sort of have a firm notion of intuition in view, I think, I think that's the thought. Um, so uh, three things, um, well first also, I think that, um, at various points in the book it seems that centrality um, is supposed to articulate something that's distinctive of philosophy, so, um, or philosophy perhaps some more, some further a priori disciplines. Um, um, for, I should say also that what he means by default justified is, um, well, yeah, we already got a story. So we already got an explication. So it's, it's that um, foundational, basically. Uh, because they also call it rock, having rock status, or rock, it's a rock bottom justificator point, so an unjustified justifier in the sort of foundational sense. Um, and then he gives two diagnostics for that. One is that um, if a judgment is non inferential and non experiential, that's one, and the other one is evidence recalcitrance, which I didn't, so I wasn't sure if that was a psychological or epistemic phenomenon or both, right? Because it's it characterized as a psychological, like just the, this, this stubbornness, basically, in face of good arguments, right? And then, but that can, may or may not be rational, right? So if you, uh, so I, I, sometimes it looks like it's something like indefeasibility. Now, of course, um, 
you can be foundational and you can I mean you can, you can think that there are foundational that there are stopping points in the chain of justification. I think that there is nothing that's <laughs> indivisible. So those things can definitely come apart. But rock sliders is having both. Right. Okay. So um, let me look more at the arguments. But let me just first then um, give you some examples of of intuitive judgments and, and just uh, what I what I take to be. And I I really don't care for the word intuition. I, it's just Partly is because it uses so messy, <laughs> both inside philosophy and outside. So, like, let's just call it whatever, blah blah, or you can call it because I do think that sometimes there are sometimes people call what I have in mind or the class category, prima facie category that I have in mind, call it intuitions or intuitive judgment. So let's call it intuitive judgment. Or okay. So what do I mean by that? Well, here is what I um, thought when uh, a few days ago. So I haven't had it, enough time to process. Um, maybe find the obvious mistakes, but here's a rough and ready general claim about what, what the intuitive judgments are, right? It's the belief or near belief, like high confidence, not quite belief, um, to the effect, uh, but that's deliberately open, and uh, that the test properties are distributed in a certain way in the salient problem case, problem case, um, where the identity of the test properties is determined by the philosophical hypothesis or theory that's under evaluation. So you have a philosophical theory that typically say when you have some modal claim, right? It, unlike some strong modal claim, uh, or just um, sometimes just possibility claim, but the theories that get tested in this kind of way often state, you know, necessary by conditional or one way implication or something. Um, they're unlike scientific theories. And so maybe it says, you know, something's F if and only if it's G. So F and G are the test properties. <laughs> so you get it and um, uh, you set up a case where you try to show in some way or other that they come apart. It, it gets a little more subtle because it's not just like you're testing the, uh, you needn't test the main claim, you can test some consequence, you can test other But, and so what counts as the test properties uh, varies not just, it depends not just on the, what the theory says, but on what part of the theory you're testing and then how you're testing it. You know, is the Getty case really testing, you know, whether knowledge is just such a belief? Well, not really. It's testing whether this what you believe is sufficient. Maybe not even that. Maybe it's testing whether, given truth and belief, justification is enough, right? So they can take some time to figure out what the test properties are. I also think they can take some time to figure out, or time is not the issue, but it can take some effort to figure out what the intuitive judgment is on its characterization, right? And I think it captures some interesting class of uh, interesting class of beliefs. Now, I don't think this is so I definitely wouldn't want to say this is a class of belief that's only built in philosophy, or it's a class of belief that has the same, uh, you know, that, that um, has, has its own unique epistemology, or even, uh, like, none of that, <laughs> I think, should be, like, um, presumed at the outset. But it's the class that we can ask intelligent and interesting questions about and try to pursue. Like, what, <laughs> you know, how do they justify it, even when they justify it? Are they knowledge? How is that? How do they, you know, what makes them reliable? Anyway. Um, that's the idea. Um, I also think we can say a little more about um, about the category, actually, a little more general. But I don't think we need to uh, to get going. But I think we can say a little more. Um, I think there are other features that are kind of interesting and not yet begging any questions. So the uh, these judgments in this category uh, are largely subjectively opaque. We can't tell. Like we can sort of tell. Or um, identify part of the uh, proximate causal chain that made us um, make the judgment. Like there was a case, there was a description of a case, or a, you know, told the case, and we were like believing something about it, but we don't know what the uh, uh, we don't we don't know the whole story that way. Um, there, it's also the uh, largely opaque, sort of introspectively, and even on um, quite some reflection, what the um, epistemic ground is. They don't fit neatly into any of the ordinary categories, which is not to say they don't in the end fit in one of them, <laughs> but they aren't in the end just inferential judgments or non-inferential judgments and or a priori, blah, 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 right? But they don't fit neatly in one of them. So that's why they're puzzling to start with. Um, uh, and I also think that they have a certain kind of strong modal uh, projection coming with the whole uh, equipment. But we don't need to even get into that. I think that we're just, there are more general things that I think you can, you can say about them. I think that they are... Uh, uh, interesting, yeah, because they're puzzling, and because they do play, they do play this role. What kind of role is it? Well, they uh, they are sometimes used um, as uh, um, uh, they, they are um, uh, correspond to the uh, uh, to the not I think 
obviously to the observation that um, um, some make, uh, scientific experiments went such and such, but to some belief about how they went. <laughs> and then, uh, uh, but that belief is then used uh, in arguments perhaps against the scientific theory. We have perhaps in an argument that in the end uh, uh, combined with other uh, uh, experimental results and so on leads to, by an inference of the best explanation, leads to new theory. I mean, there are lots of ways of using these, the contents of these um, beliefs and uh, on re of relying on the beliefs. Now, to rely on the beliefs, I think that, like, here, I guess, uh, um, uh, there, there is a, there's a fair, I mean, there's a common presumption in, in epistemology that if you're going to uh, get justification at the end, you've got to get have justification at the beginning. Um, may not go for, for everything, but if you are using, say, your judgment that Norman the clairvoyant uh, isn't justified, even though he's perfectly reliable, to argue against reliabilism, you take that, you certainly treat that belief as having some kind of rational status. Otherwise, like, you would not um, rely on it. Um, so that's the um, uh, sort of minimal hand where we're pointing at the role that I think these uh, judgments play. Okay, there's some examples. Uh, um, well, let me not do the Getty case because we want to avoid that, but uh, take, uh, so the first time you, you heard the trolley case, or so the, uh, read the trolley case with the fat man in it, right? So you may have, if you had a standard reaction, you may have judged something like, um, it's not, it would be wrong to push the fat man off the bridge, even though it would fa save five you know, lives or whatever. Um, or perhaps you would just express it like, it would be wrong. <laughs> or it would be wrong to push that man off the bridge. It doesn't matter. I mean, in the context, that man is the man who's pushing <laughs> uh, will save five people. So you have um, all the elements of the test properties are represented. Um, or take something like, uh, yeah, take something like Norman. Norman the clairvoyant, who's supposed to be perfectly reliable and is a common example uh, used to make reliabilism. Or the new evil demon case, right? The burning bat can have all these formal disbeliefs in what seems like really sort of careful and responsible ways. and. Um, it's all wrong and terribly unreliable. How could it be? Well, surely it can be justified despite the... You know, so that, that's, that would be another example. You've got to have the case. You've got to have the setup. Um, not anything with that content would be an intuitive judgment in the sense or in any... You know, but um, you, can, you can get it. Or um, what's this melon I put here on that? Well, so I think that anything can serve. <laughs> it's perfect, right? So here's, here's, a, here's a theory of consciousness. Consciousness, every, any, anything is... You know, something is conscious if and only if it's a fruit. Here's a kind of example. Imagine the melon. <laughs> that's not conscious. <laughs> so that's not conscious even though it's a fruit. That's the interior judgment. Fine. That's not so interesting. That's why we don't worry about its epistemology. We can even rather quickly figure out sort of uh, why we might, the full story of why we might have judged that. But in, in philosophically interesting cases, that's often not the case. Okay. Um, so I think that um, that uh, there's a version of centrality that's true that just deploys this minimal notion of an intuition, and that we can, um, and I, I don't think that Herman shows it's false. Um, and I also think it's interesting, <laughs> uh, because it does, you know, we can, uh, now we can ask these questions and pursue them. Uh, you know, does it, um, these epistemological questions. Um, okay, so that's that. But yeah, it would be really um, it's good to know if Herman's reaction to that, because for all I know, I missed the argument. <laughs> or just don't, don't see how it applies. Um, so let's go to the argument he uses against the uh, um, explications of centrality and the arguments um, that are considered in the book. Um, so I've just put a bunch of quotes in case you haven't read the book or in case um, you don't have it in front of you right now, just to sort of um, tease out some of the um, moves. What I, what I find um, interesting here is that it's not just that AIT, the, so the argument from intuition talk and the corresponding centrality thesis, um, uh, appeals to our use of the word intuition, which on the face of it just is terribly messy and not that work. But it's, the, the certain further things seem to be built into the um, target 
that Herman actually argues against. And, and I, I sort of tried to tease him out by, by looking at um, what he's saying. So, so there's one complaint. Um, when a speaker of English says intuitively blah, that doesn't show she's relying on intuitions as evidence, of course, but she says it's highly context sensitive. And there is no one content, there's no one content that's expressed with such utterance. And so no one version of centrality can be supported. Okay? Um, further, um, and then he goes on to talk about uh, one of the uses, uh, uh, which is to use in intuitively as a hedge, right? So to uh, lessen your, to like, to like uh, signal that you're not, um, really is, you're not just kind of maybe full out asserting, or at least you're, you're, you're just lessening your commitment a little bit. Um, and you can also, it can be used as a hedge, and so as he explains in the book, it can be used as a hedge, and, and then at the same time descriptively, perhaps to say that, you know, I'm, <laughs> uh, this was reached with little reflection, or uh, this is just a um, temporary sort of interim conclusion, and so on, or it can be used just as a hedge. Okay, so that use, he says, uh, um, uh, to get the, the hedge use together with uh, the signaling indication that you haven't carefully reflected, um, that doesn't support an interesting or relevant version of centrality. Okay? Um, Next, there's no, um, he argues that, or claims that there's no one, no well-disciplined or well-understood function or meaning we can assign the terms intuitively. Uh, and this is important for an understanding of centrality um, because uh, if it is the ordinary, if intuition as it's used in this formulation is the ordinary English term, then centrality has a false presupposition. Um, so what it's beginning to look like, and then later, uh, again, when talking, this, so this was all about the English, ordinary English version of argument from intuition talk. But then later when he goes on to talk about the uh, uh, sort of, uh, sort of semi-technical use that philosophers might have or engage in, um, then he says something similar, namely that he complains that, after giving you a bunch of convincing examples, that what they should make abundantly clear is that no one interpretation will account for all the cases. So, um, so what this makes me think is that, well, so is this uh, argument from intuition not even worse than I thought? Like, does it, is, is it assumed that there is a unique or unified use of intuition terminology? That clearly doesn't have to be an assumption, but it seems to be something that, um, that's there. Okay, so in the next, um, so then the other, um, the next point um, concerns how such a use, if there is one, or how it, um, some sub-use uh, could and would support centrality if it did. Mm -hmm. Like, how, how, what would it take right, for it to support centrality? Um, and here I think something else come, is coming out that's interesting. So, um, so he's saying that um, the saying that P with a hedge, that use of intuition, right, is in no way to treat something called intuition as evidence or a sort of a source of evidence. Um, and then he says, when intuitive use in other ways means the same as pre-theoretic, um, then. Uh, you're, you're, you're just saying something that doesn't identify an evidential sort, uh, source for P or say anything about how P is justified. Um, okay, so, so there are similar claims later on, and then there are more substantial. It's, then there's there, there's, uh, uh, then he also argues that there's no uh, sort of direct evidence that, that, that any, uh, anyone who um, talks about intuitions in, in any of these ways like, has in mind that. Uh, um, that um, these intuitions are evidence in the full, full-on um, uh, sort of dealer type sense that they are accompanied by distinctive phenomenology, or um, that they are justified by based on conceptual competence. So, what? So again, what does it make me wonder? Well, whether um, the argument, argument from intuition talk, was supposed to go like this. So there's a there's a um, unique or unified use of intuition. An intuition, this, this intuition, an intuition is synonymous with, or at least coextensive with, something like evidence or type T evidence or um, you know, evidence with a distinctive phenomenology. Um, and then to treat something as evidence or evidence of that sort is to think that it is evidence of that sort. So neither of these things seem right, and they also seem like they're not needed to get something like AIT off the ground, right? So, so because if that is the view, like where is that? Is there a unique, unified use of intuition in ordinary English or philosophy English such that when we use it uh, to characterize something as an intuition, um, we mean that it's evidence. Um, or at least we're saying something that's coextensive with the same evidence. Well, no, well, first, no, because there's no unified notion of intuition in ordinary English or philosophy English. And secondly, because there's no, nothing that's synonymous with it. Is there, is there maybe some sub-use that's like, 
if not synonymous with evidence, uh, or is it some usage, some um, uh, of all these usages that is um, it's not synonymous, uh, on which intuition isn't synonymous with, with evidence, but perhaps at least coextensive? It seems to me there actually is one. Um, <laughs> uh, and I'm not talking about this sort of what I call the mysticist one in the handout, which is the one that you know you see if you if you Google intuition. Uh, as, you, as you say, probably like the first thing to come up is all these psychic, you know, websites. But but I don't have that in mind because it's not really a good candidate here. But here's here's one. <laughs> There's a use of intuition or a use of intuitively p or it's intuitive that p on it just means it's prima facie plausible that p, right? <laughs> now it's not. It, I mean, I'm not going to push it because I don't um, like sort of invested in this strategy in the first place. But it seems that um, that. It wouldn't surprise me if philosophy, the way philosophers use that, uh, is the way they also use <laughs> prima facie, or when it, what they're prepared, or what they do uh, sincerely call uh, say that about, like it's uh, intuitively p, meaning it's prima facie plausible that p. It's also stuff that they're prepared to treat as prima facie evidence. <laughs> okay, so that seems right, but it gives us a completely uninteresting version of like. Uh, uh, interesting version of centrality. It's not just that it's not distinctive, anywhere near distinctive philosophy, but it just comes to something like this. Um, centrality is saying that um, prima facie, you know, <laughs> prima facie evidence is treated as, as evidence. I mean, what kind of evidence? Prima, prima facie evidence, right? <laughs> so so that, maybe that's why someone doesn't um, uh, spend even that, this long on that. But. It, so we want, we want something more specific, and then the question is, is there something more specific, right? Is there some use of uh, intuition or intuitive and so on that, we, that is um, uh, at least um, coextensive with evidence or type T evidence? I don't, I, I don't think so either. I mean, the, the, the thing is that the art, this strategy, if I understand it right, doesn't need that even. It doesn't need that. It needs something like there is a use of intuitive or uh, intuition such that when philosophers use that to describe um, a judgment or a proposition, then they are <laughs> they are also treating that judgment as providing evidence or treating that proposition as evidence, right? They don't need it to go the other way around. They can totally be other kinds of evidence. <laughs> of course, they are the kinds of evidence. So and and they and so it, and it, and if that's the claim, I mean that seems to me to be right. We use sometimes use intuition for these kinds of judgments that I tried to single out before with examples, and we um, probably use it sometimes to mean. Um, uh, or sometimes for for things that we just think are prima facie plausible and so on. So I don't. I think that's right. And if one really was set on this strategy, then uh, then that's all you need. Now, um, because uh, intuition is used for so many other things, I wouldn't recommend this strategy. That's why I think it's not a great. You know, like this, I said, I'm not invested in it. But that seems to be all I need. Um, uh, in any case, it's not the word that matters. Now, what's what's, what's um, uh, what's important though, but if you, uh, uh, and another reason, um, uh, other than, a reason other than just worry about, uh, and like adding to the confusion <laughs> about the use of this word, um, or getting lost in the confusion, um, another worry is that, of course, if, you, if you're doing this, then you need, um, uh, you need uh, to rely in the end on something like argument from philosophical practice. Because, so, so here it's, <laughs> um, uh, I mean, so, so the idea would be this. Look, there's something that philosophy. So, what are the uses of intuition or intuitive cognitive notions? Um, uh, it's such that when philosophers use it, um, they're talking about a certain kind of evidence. Okay, so now how do we show that? Well, identify what it is, you know, say what it is to think of it as evidence or treat it as evidence. Identify uh, what kind of role, presumably, that um, uh, P has when it's treated as evidence in that way. So, um, that, at least, I mean, maybe it's not the only way, but it seems the most straightforward way then of supplementing this, or like actually getting this argument off the ground, uh, given that the synonymy and so on, <laughs> uh, things uh, don't work. So, uh, interestingly, I mean, so Herman doesn't really argue against this, but of course, if his argument is against argument, um, the, if his argument, kind of argument is against this APP centrality and, and the uh, argument from philosophical practice, if they work, uh, and there's no specific evidential role that intuitions play, no specific way that they're treated as evidence, then also there is no way, no specific way in which they're treated as evidence and called intuitions. <laughs> so of course, <laughs> it works, right? So, um, so we could just defer to this argument, so I'll do that on his behalf. Um, 
Okay, and then we can actually turn to those arguments, because uh, I think that that's, that's the way to go. I mean, if you want to argue for centrality, it's not the intuition talk, it's just neither here nor there. Um, or rather, it's all over the place. Um, let's get on to that. Oh, that's not Okay, yeah, so then, um, so then uh, Herman has um, various uh, complaints about, um, or, or misgivings about the possibility of identifying a role for, uh, for uh, something like intuitions. Right? Um, and now I think, the, again, the worry is, my worry is that um, his, um, um, his target is, is just, uh, Just, just off on the wrong track. So, so he's he the, the kind of role that he um, sets out to sort of find is the role that's given by. Uh, I mean, that's that's um, uh, given by these three features, uh, these three substantial features, three substantial <laughs> epistemological uh, uh, sort of Beeler type. I mean, I call them. If you haven't read Beeler, the, the reason I, I call this uh, Beeler centrality or uh, Beeler intuition is because he thinks that. Intuitions are, they're not even, I mean, they're not beliefs, they're the sui generis phenomenal state, and they have uh, uh, other uh, properties. I mean, that's a substantial thesis about intuitions. I, I don't think it's the best way to initially identify, <laughs> for reasons I, I gave before, right? But, um, um, so my, I mean, I've sort of already said what, what my worry is about those views, so I'm not going to go over it. I'm going to um, um, just um, go back, get back to parallels, because, so, I gave a bunch of patterns before, and then said something vaguely, something sketchy, but you know. And uh, so, so uh, Herman critically discusses the field paradigms in actually in 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 the course of criticizing argument from intuition talk. And he thinks so. I, I use um, paradigms in another, well, in in a paper on intuitions. And then uh, Herman says that um, that's no good. Uh, and it's in the context of argument from intuition talk, and he's, he's arguing that the field of paradigms can't uh, really achieve a unified usage, um, or even a coherent, I think, some sort of usage of, of, of the word intuition, because there are not enough agreement on cases, um, or like what const constitutes paradigms, right? And we can expect very divergent projections from, uh, from, um, from cases. Now, I, I have to do no quarrel with this, because it seems to me, uh, um, I mean, I'm pessimistic about how people project too. If not, if no other, for no other reason uh, than that, people often project in unjustified and in principle ways, right? From, so, so if, it, if we're just making a sociological claim about how to get people to talk about the same thing by using paradigms, that's gonna be hard, right? Just like, but, um, but uh, also, I mean, they, I have no uh, quarrel with with the um, strategy, with the kind of strategy flawed as an attempt to uh, unify and like in. A, a divergent use, you, sort of unify the practice of using this word intuition or, or making, because that's not what I'm trying to do. And I don't, I, it doesn't seem to me like um, very important, and it doesn't seem to me that that's gonna, uh, it's not gonna work in this way, right? So, but parents, I think, can be used exactly to home in on the, on the category, leaving completely open, like, <laughs> like in lots, all directions, like how it, um, you know, like how, how um, where the borders are, and I think that is important. <laughs> That's really important if you want to be uh, um, sort of unbiased when you investigate. We can't leave everything open because then we can't start. But if we're doing it smart, we can leave the epistemic features open, and yeah, so. Um, so, do you think? Okay, now, no, I got confused because here's my handout, and it has much more on it. <laughs> right. Um, rather than repeating what I said about these candidates' roles, um, just again emphasize that with the kind of role I think we should look for if we want it. Um, maybe, you know, maybe it's possible to really quite firm up this um, general uh, description a lot, but we should look for a dialectical role, like not for a uh, role that's um, 
sort of it's sort of functionally defined. Another role that's defined by by these um, epistemic uh, epistemological features. Um, now, as also it turns out, in the um, there's a long and, and yeah like illuminating discussion of or like of of uh, uh, what what. Uh, presentation, what I would put it like, this is what presentation of problem case actually looked like. <laughs> so Herman uses the, the, a bunch of case studies, like, and asked, where is the equation? Like, which one is it? <laughs> and and then, um, but then, um, and that's, that's it, it's very interesting, and it made me think that maybe it's even harder than I thought to sort of tease out what the case is. I just think that's what it is about. I mean, the case needn't be, like, you, you needn't be able to identify a string of sentences. That's the case, and it looks like a case, and, you know, like, you may have to look at what the theory, what exactly is the theory that's being challenged, and, like, how is it, like, and tease it out, right? But but it's very interesting to see the discussion. Now, the, the um, uh, we'll see these cases, like, really um, uh, pick apart. The, the, um, uh, the criteria then, however, who are, that are used to to um, um, argue against uh, various candidate computer judgments or intuition are these substantial criteria, and they turn out to be even more substantial than I thought of first. So, rock, for example, has these two aspects, right? It's not just foundational, but something like indefeasible, uh, and also, um, uh, you're not supposed to. Um, there's a presumption that you're not supposed to argue for intuition. I mean, you can argue for all kinds of things that are excellent candidates for being. Uh, non inferentially justified, right? So, you know, it's it's um, uh, it's bright in here, right? It is, you know, it's, I can start arguing for that. There's no problem. It's not that like interesting, so I probably won't, but we can also argue about all kinds of uh, um, parameters, as people do in these cases. Um, um, further, oh, furthermore, yeah, furthermore, there's there's a complaint that uh, keeps reoccurring, which is that. Uh, but which one is the judgment? Look, there's lots of different ones. And here's, you know, which one? Uh, now, um, I think that's fine. So if you have, and they can be, uh, I also, I don't think it's completely um, uh, um, fine. It's just as far as, far as there being uh, 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 something, um, a judgment of this category, or, or five, you know, that, that the author in the end ends up arguing against that, like Perry does. I mean, we can. There might be a multitude of of uh, um, uh, of intuitive judgment. There might be a multitude of cases in a given passage. There might be a, a, a conflicting intuitive judgment. This is, you know, this is what happens a lot in epistemology. It's like it's fine. I mean, judgment. I mean, they can both be true, perhaps, but they can be justified uh, and they can um, exist. <laughs> I mean, that, that doesn't seem to be a problem. So um, anyway, so let me wrap up um, by just saying that um, I think. He, uh, I think this argument from intuition talk is a non-starter, however it's elaborated, and that this um, argument from philosophical practice is a non-starter as elaborated in Herman's book. Um, and I think that Herman is absolutely right, though, that the way to assess it, um, the, this better option, right, the, uh, argument from philosophical practice and the corresponding centralities, is to check what these people are doing, right, the contemporary and later philosophers. My later philosophy, presumably. Um, uh, and likewise, I take it for the refinement of this argument and the centrality of thesis, supposing that you're not worrying about whether it's true, but like, how do we actually understand it? You know, like, because even if we can't, again, even if we can't, uh, uh, and needn't initially like really firm it up. I mean, it's sometimes you do it as you go along. Right? So, can we, uh, so how do we do that? Well, if we look. Uh, since we are concerned, it's an, it's like a, the ultimately navel gazing practice. We're concerned with our own practice, so we've got to look at the practice. But looking at the practice doesn't just mean looking at what people who are engaged in the practice say that they do, or what some arguably mistaken metaphilosophers say that they do. That's... Um, yeah. <laughs>